Hello, I'm Chris Sullivan, and I want to welcome you to the fourth webinar in our Swiss Re Corporate Solutions Risk Management Series for 2020. We started these webinars several years ago to cover industry trends and topics you wanted to hear about from us. Thanks to everyone who's joined uh, our earlier events, and for those new to this series, you can find all past recordings on our website. Today we'll have a slightly different format, a panel discussion followed by questions from the audience. You could submit your questions anytime during the session via the Q&A chat box. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please hit Control F5. Now let's get started. In April, the Swiss Re Institute released its annual Natural Catastrophe Sigma publication that analyzed the growing cost of climate risk. There's been an ongoing debate on whether there is a clear connection between climate change and natural catastrophes. Today, we'll look at the effects of a change in climate on NACAT activity, and most importantly, its impact on the economy and the insurance sector. With me today, I have Megan Lincoln, a senior NACAT underwriter for Swiss Re Corporate Solutions, and Thomas Holzoy, Chief Economist for the Americas from the Swiss Re Institute. Welcome, Megan and Thomas. So we're Hi, Chris. About a month Thank you for the introduction. Into, we're, we're a month into the 2020 hurricane season. What can we say about a link between climate change and NATCAT activity? All right. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the um, for the introduction. And um, I would like to start this uh, if we um, move to the next slide. Chris made reference to the, um, the statistics that we put out in the in the Sigma, and this is um, actually a, a tradition that goes uh, back uh, 50 years now, uh, where we collect. Uh, we have an annual issue where we collect uh, data on cat losses. And um, so this is an important um, backdrop for, for to start this discussion at the teed off. Let's just look at the facts. What do we know in to, uh, from the side of um, uh, economic uh, losses, insurance losses? Uh, what do we see uh, in the data? And um, so fresh from, from this, uh, the latest issue in 2019, uh, for example, we had 137 billion uh, dollars of uh, of losses, uh, economic losses, and um, 52 billion of that uh, were insured. This is um, was just uh, marginally uh, below the 10-year average, which is somewhere around 60 billion um, of uh, uh, um, on a 10-year average of uh, insured uh, losses that are related um, to nat natural catastrophes. Now. Um, if you look a little bit further into that, um, the, the vast majority of these um, NATCAT losses um, are weather-related. So if you strip out from these catastrophes, um, overall the tally we, we strip out um, man-made losses and uh, earthquakes, then we get to the weather-related, and this is um, the, the link to uh, climate change, um, which is uh, most of the, the intersection to, to CAT losses. Uh, is uh, is very related. So looking at those data, what's the the long term trend? And if you look at this uh, the chart here that's on the on the screen, uh, we see that it's uh, th there's a trend up. And these are inflation adjusted. Uh, so there is obviously um, a, a story behind it. Um, there's also a lot of fluctuation, and this fluctuation, uh, this natural fluctuation of of large events is one of the reasons why this analysis is not um, um, that easy. But if you look at the long-term trends, we see that these uh, weather-related um, NATCAT losses um, have been increasing at an annual average rate of about 6% um, over the last 30 years or so. So this is a clear um, trend upwards, and that goes um, that is, is in excess of um, of uh, economic development um, or uh, yes other um, population growth, and so we, we certainly have a, um, a st strong increase um, in these cat losses, and uh, that's one of the starting points. So what um, how can we look further into um, into this uh, this bigger theme? If you move to the uh, next slide, please. 
uh, one of the themes that um, has materialized um, over the last um, couple of years um, is that we more and more um, see a, um, a manifestation of, of, uh, of, of cat losses uh, around uh, what we call secondary perils. And so what are those? These are um, the, the primary perils uh, are the um, is, is earthquake and hurricane. These are the uh, primary only in, in, in the sense of uh, they have been modeled and analyzed uh, further back than, than these other perils. Uh, secondary perils are either <coughs> um, perils like uh, um, hailstorms, uh, um, uh, tornadoes, uh, flood, uh, winter storms or droughts. Um, they either stand alone or there are also secondary perils that are um, triggered by um, by a primary peril, and particularly uh, relevant in this context are hurricanes. Um, and the secondary peril that uh, more often than, uh, is attached uh, is following a hurricane is uh, flood events um, that um, are uh, taking up an increasing part of the, uh, the losses um, related to um, these major events. So we see this as uh, this is one of the changes that's happening, and uh, we see this um, out of the existing data. And uh, what are these trends? So more and more small to mid-sized um, uh, catastrophes um, are um, taking up a bigger change, a bigger, bigger chunk of the, of the overall um, cat losses. So it's, uh, over, if you look at the last 10 years, it's about 60% of, um, of these insured losses that come from uh, from the secondary uh, perils, um, uh, accumulation of um, of smaller uh, to mid-sized events. Yeah, so these are not the, the super mega cats like a Hurricane Katrina, uh, but it's um, we have um, uh, many years where there are dozens of uh, billion plus dollar events. And um, to name a few is, is the, the, the California wildfires. Uh, the many years where we have uh, several um, tornadoes that are in the multi-billion dollar uh, range of, of losses. Um, but then also uh, flood and uh, typhoons, um, and that's, that's not just the US, but uh, we see that um, a lot in, in 2019 in Japan, uh, but then also in Europe. So it is um, a, a frequency of, of, of small to mid-sized events that is uh, starting to drive the overall uh, loss burden. Um, related to that is the, the observation that uh, some of these events uh, that uh, we s simply as an industry didn't pay so much attention to in the past um, have um, great surprises in the, in the order of magnitude of losses that they produce. And uh, wildfires um, are probably here on the, on the forefront uh, where um, just in the last couple of years, we see uh, an accumulation of um, a lot of uh, very large events. And uh, as an example, the Camp wildfire uh, triggered or caused a loss of, uh, of 12 billion. And um, these in itself are orders of magnitudes that uh, a decade ago was, uh, was not thought really of. And um, so wildfires were um, further back not really paid so much attention to. So this is one of the big uh, major changes is that it's, there are more perils now, or more types of uh, risks uh, that actually can, can uh, cause significant losses. So we had the, the accumulation or the frequency of, of, of uh, small to medium sized uh, losses, but also uh, the, the magnitude of, um, of some of these events um, that become rather big. And, uh, and then, um, more and more, we see that um, it's, uh, it's uh, water and wind related, and it's um, a lot of the, uh, the very large events have been floods, and have been floods that um, have followed um, hurricane losses and or hurricane events. And, um, and so there are hurricanes, and um, for example, Harvey in 2017, where the, the wind damage uh, was not the major contributor to the overall loss scenario, but it was the, the flooding of the severe rainfall um, that uh, followed after. So it's a, it's a mixture of, um, 
of the of, of frequency and severity of these types of secondary uh, events. And uh, at this point, I uh, would like to hand over to, to Megan to, to go more into depth on this aspect. Thank you, Thomas. And if we can advance to the next slide, please. So Thomas mentioned, as he was discussing the secondary perils and the impact that they are having on the insurance industry, he specifically highlighted flood and specifically highlighted Hurricane Harvey, which um, struck the southern Texas coast in 2017, but is better known for its impact in the Houston metropolitan area, where it dumped a significant amount of rainfall over the course of several days and led to widespread flooding in the area. Uh, Hurricane Harvey was referred to in literature, um, in industry discussions, as a 500 to 1,000 year flood event for the city of Houston. But if we look back over time, 500 year flood events in Houston are no longer becoming infrequent events. Uh, since, 2000, since the year 2000, we've seen three events that have produced enough rainfall and led to enough significant flooding in the greater Houston area that these would be considered 500-year events. We started with her, uh, Tropical Storm Allison in 2001, which did something very similar to Harvey, where it stalled over the Houston area for several days and dumped copious amounts of rainfall, which led to widespread flooding around the metropolitan area. And then 16 years later, Harvey came along and did even more damage than Allison, um, partially due to the increased urban development of the Houston area. And then two years later, Tropical Storm Imelda did the same thing along the Texas coast. It hit slightly further along the Texas coast, closer to Louisiana, but still did impact that same North Texas Houston area. And it too stalled out, dumped significant rain, and areas were inundated with water. So climate change and our development in high hazard areas is leading to a setup where we no longer see 500 year flood events occurring infrequently. They're occurring quite frequently and they're having more and more of a financial impact on the areas that they hit. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back to Chris who's going to introduce our next question and topic. You both mentioned an increase in unpredictability when it comes to secondary perils. Thomas, what does that mean for risk modeling and what does that mean for risk assessment going forward? So thanks. Uh, let's uh, advance to the next slide, please. Um, so there is there are certain observations that um, that we are <coughs> Um, we are making, and there's different degrees of, of linking these to uh, to climate change as uh, the, the scientific evidence. And uh, then there is there's also the um, the question of um, how confident are we, uh, or, or how much do we know about how these how these trends then relate to specific perils. Yeah, and so to to make this. Um, a little bit more more concrete. Um, so there's there's a very clear um, consensus uh, in the scientific uh, community that we observe increasing mean temperatures and uh, Earth surface temperatures and um, a very um, direct link to to a peril is um, that uh, increases uh, um, temperatures. The um, the um, have led to melting glaciers and, and also to expansion of uh, the, the ocean. Um, and so we, we see the sea levels rise. And as a result of sea level rises, it's very straightforward in terms of the modeling um, to, um, to conclude that we get um, uh, more severe uh, storm surges in case of a, um, of, of a severe of a, a hurricane or a cyclone. So, so this is something where there's um, a very, a very direct uh, link, and um, we also um, another link for the, the temperature. This is um, melting permafrost it causes landslides. Um, these, these are um, so these are secondary perils where we have uh, where we have uh, a very good um, understanding um, of 
of, of the, the, the trend and of the, the, the link into the, the parallel. Uh, another one, there is um, uh, an observation and uh, is that we have an increasing uh, variability of, of temperatures. Uh, so we have uh, uh, more extreme uh, outcomes. Uh, so not just the, that the average temperature is, is going up, uh, but we get uh, heat waves, um, and um, as, a, as a result, um, there is droughts. There is um, yeah, um, it, it affects uh, um, the, the water flow. We have uh, we have uh, um, impacting on, on on river systems, and we have um, quite relevant for for North America um, as it's a, it's a key driver uh, for for wildfires. So. Again, this is something where um, um, secondary perils um, um, have uh, have a rather direct link to to this um, to the observation that uh, there are more extreme uh, temperature outcomes. Yeah, so, and, and there is there is uh, evidence uh, and um, understanding um, to to a sufficient degree in the scientific community that uh, global warming. Um, climate change is uh, is uh, in, in certain areas uh, in, in Europe, North America is leading to these uh, these more extreme uh, temperature outcomes. And another um, aspect of this um, related to the um, rising temperature is that um, um, warmer air um, can hold more moisture, and uh, and so the, this is. Uh, Pure physics, um, more moisture than into the air. Uh, that means also there is more um, extreme rainfall possible, and so this is another link um, where we see um, uh, more extreme rainfalls, and uh, these are then inland river flood events. And it's one of the um, the observations that I, I showed earlier is that we see um, more often um, these uh, uh, yeah, floods and uh, Extreme rainfall-driven uh, inland flooding as, um, as a um, scenario of uh, secondary perils. Um, then there are other um, areas uh, where where there is uh, um, a lot of scientific debate, but uh, where the, the modeling and the links are a bit more complex and complicated. So we we don't have the same degree of um, of confidence and certainty about these links. Yeah, and so uh, there are impacts on on uh, climate cycles, and uh, <clears throat> there's the so one of the question is that um, we may see um, th there's some evidence that uh, tropical cyclones uh, get more severe, um, but um, there is there's less of a, um, uh, an understanding about the the frequency of of hurricanes. Yeah, and this is because there are uh, a, vari a variety of um, <clears throat> uh, impact factors and shear winds, and um, it's it's more complex to to actually model and figure out how um, how con um, hurricanes develop and then where they actually go and whether they make make landfall is is, an, is another question. Yeah. And um, so this also relates. Um, there is uh, um, an observation or uh, belief in increased convection, so trans basically moving energy um, from from hotter temperatures to colder temperatures through the air, and that this drives hail and tornado risk. Um, but these are very complicated um, weather systems uh, for modeling, and so there is there's a bit of a higher um, a degree of, of uncertainty around this. So. How do we, we summarize this? Or this is, so, um, so one aspect why, again, why secondary parallels play in here is um, that, um, as mentioned, there's, these are smaller to mid-size events, and we we have a, a high observation of those. Uh, there are there's simply more of them. So there's, uh, to some degree, there's simply more evidence uh, to analyze statistically. And so we we know more about um, the the actual manifestation um, of of these, uh, these weather events over the last uh, few decades. Um, with large hurricanes, um, they are not that often. Yeah, so we simply have to deal with uh, with um, 
So it's 40 observations and uh, it's, a, it's a smaller number. So it's more difficult, you need more more time essentially to, to come uh, and draw uh, conclusions. And so the, the, the modeling here, it's, um, there's, it's one of the challenges for the industry uh, and for, uh, for the, the uh, uh, scientific community to going forward to, um, yeah, to keep their eyes on the ball and advance these, uh, the, the observations, the quality of these observations and the, the analysis of these trends. And um, if we move to the next slide, I want to show a little bit the this connection of uh, of this uh, um, the, the challenge uh, uh, around the modeling uh, and uh, we and the the, the time horizon of uh, um, of observations we do have, and so it's it's rather important um, if there are trends uh, that we haven't understood fully yet uh, to, to properly um, uh, capture them in the modeling. And uh, the, one of the, yeah, so what I'm trying to show here with this, with this graph is, is it's, a, it's a series of, of data and we can, uh, that's related to, to apparel. And um, if we, um, if we, if you simply look at uh, try to to capture uh, the the maximum uh, or a very large uh, history of data and and average this um, and this this may have been good practice for for a long while um, if there's no trend in it uh, then the averaging it and trying to reach out for as much data as possible um, is, is is a good thing um, but if we if there's a trend in there, as, as we, we we show here in, in, on this graph, and um, there's a trend in the historic data, um, if we if we just average, uh, then we are actually um, if we look at the the more the, the current climate, which which would be uh, represented by uh, the the observations of the data close to that uh, vertical line in the uh, in the middle of the chart, uh, if we if we long reach far back with the observations and don't capture the trend properly, then we are simply off with the modeling. And, um, and so the, this goes beyond even the, the knowing what's going forward. Yeah? And this is what's depicted in the, in the right uh, side of the, of the chart. If there are possible different uh, outcomes, um, how the climate develops or how a certain peril develops. Uh, but even um, to to know where we are at the current moment and to properly assess the risk is really important to to capture these uh, the trend properly and know what is um, yeah to to take the trend out of the historic data or identify properly the trend in the historic data and this can be this can be driven by climate change but there are many other factors that put trend into uh, into lost data, yeah, and so and those are socially economic factors and others, and uh, I think this is uh, something that we will uh, be talking about later. So I hand it back to to Chris to, for our next question. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, Megan, I'm going to turn this next piece over to you uh, to comment on the connection between climate change and economic development. Thank you, Chris. Um, and as Thomas highlighted in his previous discussion, there's a lot that can impact any trend that we see in losses. And in the case of climate change and economic development, it's, it's a challenge to isolate the financial impact of each because they are happening in tandem um, and they are uh, happening in a way to come together and increase the losses that we're seeing. If we look at climate change alone, what we know about climate change is that it is having an impact on many of the natural perils that we observe. Uh, we know that out in the, uh, in the West, wildfire season is lengthening. Uh, what used to be a spring, summer, early fall phenomenon now in some ca cases poses a threat year-round. We are seeing wetter tropical cyclones in line with what Thomas said earlier about a warmer atmosphere simply being able to hold more moisture and then rain that moisture out. Harvey was a very wet tropical cyclone 
Um, Florence, which occurred in 2018, was a very wet tropical cyclone. If we look back to 2015, we even see, while it didn't make landfall, as it passed off the coast of South Carolina, Hurricane Joaquin led to a significant amount of rainfall and significant flooding along the coast of South Carolina. So these tropical cycl uh, hurricanes are generating more and more rainfall as they're capable of holding more and more moisture in a warmer climate. Um, another impact that we expect to see in a warmer climate is slower moving tropical cyclones. And while we can't definitively say that storms which in recent memory have been slow moving are due to climate change, the patterns that we are seeing are consistent with what we would expect in a warmer world. Again, Harvey is another example of that. It meandered over the Houston area for several days and just rained and rained and rained. Florence stalled off the coast of South Carolina and again North Carolina and again produced ample rainfall as it just hung right on shore. And then more recently last year we saw Hurricane Dorian stall over the Bahamas and pound parts of the Bahamas with relentless wind, storm surge, and rain for days. And Dorian went through the Bahamas as a Category 5 hurricane. Um, so Category 5 hurricane conditions for 48 to 72 hours are going to be extraordinarily devastating, and that's exactly what we witnessed on the ground there. And then the other way that climate change can impact, uh, d directly impact economic loss is climate change is very closely linked to rising sea levels. And that's, uh, sea levels are rising due to two, two factors. The first is uh, warmer water. As water warms up, it expands. Uh, and the second cause of rising sea level is the melting of land ice, which is running off the land and going into the ocean, increasing sea levels. And going back even further than more recent years to 2012, Hurricane Sandy, that affected the New York area. Uh, the water level at the battery has increased by about 18 inches since the middle of the 19th century, so the 1850s. And what happens is Sandy had an extra foot and a half of water to push further inland when it approached the New York area at the very unique angle that it did. And we saw the extreme devastation that it brought to the coasts of New Jersey and New York. And this will only further increase with time as sea levels continue to rise. Um, and even now, today, we don't need a hurricane to cause disruptive flooding. There's a phenomenon known as sunny day flooding, where areas which are already low-lying due to sea level rise are becoming regularly inundated during high tide cycles. And an example of that is Miami Beach. It's now not uncommon for the highest high tide cycle of the year, which occurs actually about every six months, to cause street flooding in Miami and to inundate some parking garages. And not only is that disruptive to residents that are there who have to navigate through several inches of water, but it can also significantly damage infrastructure because that's salt water that's permeating up through the land and it can degrade uh, infrastructure in the area, road surfaces, underwater pipes, etc. So we are definitely seeing impacts of climate change on our losses and disruption just to our lifestyle alone. But then we also have the impact of high hazard development. Uh, within the western U.S., approximately 60% of homes that have been built since the 1990s were built in what's known as the wildland urban interface. And that's essentially the boundary between human sprawl and natural forest land. And as those two boundaries commingle, and we encroached on natural forest land, the wildfire threat to human-made structure increases. Uh, wildfires are actually naturally occurring and healthy for forests, but the devastation occurs when we build structures within those forests and wildfires occur. They take out the structures along with the forests themselves. Um, there's also the concern that structures more easily spread fire to each other. This is known as urban conflagration, which is what we saw in Santa Rosa a couple years ago during the Tubbs fire, uh, 2017. The wildfire itself did not necessarily 
jump from neighborhood to neighborhood or house to house. It was a house would catch on fire. The embers would come off of that house and be transported to another house. The embers would land on the roof, spark a subsequent fire. Um, also, this goes back to the sunny day flooding. Miami, Miami Beach are built on soft soil. Those, in addition to the sea level rising, Miami and Miami Beach are gradually sinking. So when you have rising water levels and sinking land, you're going to have a greater disparity between the water and the land, and there's going to be a higher propensity for floods to occur. Um, and then the last piece is really reconfiguring nature. In addition to developing in areas where there is an inherent risk from natural catastrophes, uh, we also re-engineer a lot of nature. Uh, Hurricane Katrina is sadly a very good example of that. The Mississippi River in the area of New Orleans to allow for maritime commerce has been levied and constrained, and this has led to land subsidence. New Orleans is sinking at approximately the, a rate of a foot per year. Um, but also the river, when water, when water from the various tributaries of the Mississippi flows into the Mississippi and down the Mississippi, the river can no longer naturally overtop its banks, uh, deposit sediment, which actually creates new land, and then contract as the water goes into the Gulf. It's now constrained by these, these series of, of levees and other directional infrastructure and engineering that has been pulled in, put in to avoid flooding the city of New Orleans. Um, also another example is we've already touched on Houston and how devastating Harvey was. One of the reasons that Houston is very prone to flooding is because Houston naturally is a swamp. A swamp is very efficient at absorbing water when it rains, but the permeable surfaces, grass, soil, trees, that are capable of absorbing water, rainwater when it falls have been replaced by non-permeable surfaces, roadways, parking lots, parking garages. And when that water falls, instead of being absorbed by the land, it runs off into the bayous in the area and can more easily flood residential and commercial areas. So the, the increase in financial impacts of extreme weather that we are witnessing and have witnessed over the past several decades is not only driven by climate change alone, it's driven by a combination of climate change and how we exist within our ecosystem and how we can sometimes have a tendency to even disrupt the natural systems that are meant to be resilient to extreme weather and extreme climate events. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Chris for our, ne or actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn it back over to Thomas, who's going to elaborate a little more. Yeah, thanks. I just want to add some some more uh, economic angle to this uh, <clears throat> to this uh, the growth and exposure base, and uh, which is one of the the key drivers, um, you know, putting exposure in, into harm's way. And um, easy one is to start out with these uh, with these pictures, and um, probably have seen these all before. So we, we see this this enormous um, development here of um, of Shanghai just over the last 25 years, uh, from a seemingly sleepy place to a sprawling, uh, highly built up uh, modern uh, modern city. And this is obviously um, see. Uh, Enormous amount of capital accumulation, uh, and um, and then similarly we see the similar um, uh, the same effect with for Miami, and here we have pictures that are a little bit further apart, yeah, but uh, in the end tell tell a similar story. But uh, what I want to show here is the difference is that um, is the that is that enormous speed of change um, in China and uh, and all over Asia. Uh, and uh, so this is, uh, if, we, if we talk about um, economic development as a driver, it is of particular um, importance um, in, in emerging Asia. And um, the, one of the key drivers is this, uh, is this uh, uh, massive urbanization. And um, that's something we, continue, we expect to continue. And there are forecasts that um, up to, the, to 2050, um, that the, um, we see for the, for the next couple of decades, about 90% of, of urbanization, on, and particularly driven by this development of these mega cities, uh, will come um, will happen in Asia and in Africa. 
so there's there's a bit of a, an unequal uh, distribution of of this um, exposure and a lot of these cities um, in um, in Africa and in Asia are coastal so this is where um, often con connected to to, uh, to traffic um, and transport hubs and, um, and to the economic development uh, but this also happens to be areas where they are uh, exposed to uh, natural hazards. Um, we also have this uh, this phenomenon, uh, the the growth of um, into the wildland urban interface. Um, it, it's it's a broader theme in in the, uh, in mature economies uh, like in the U.S. or uh, Canada, is that uh, land is scarce and the, uh, a lot of the good um, easy um, develop uh, uh, lands to develop are taken up. Uh, so as as the development continues, um, it moves the activity moves into what we call marginal lands. You know, these are lands that in the past have been not uh, considered, and some of them are in harm's way, you know, be it from from wildfire, uh, be it in a flood plain uh, and exposed to flooding, flooding and so on. So there are some there are some economic uh, themes behind this. Um, that basically the, the good land goes first and then the, the more risky one, uh, one of the aspects of, of the marginal land, um, or it's at a slant, so it's exposed to the landslides and so on. Um, but we, we have some, basically, uh, some of these bigger economic drivers that create this, uh, you know, increase the, um, the development moving into harm's way. And then the, the final one is its capital accumulation and um, Buildings are the, the, the structure and the content are getting more expensive, uh, and some of this is, uh, is simply a result of, of um, economic development. Again, you know, if, if societies become more affluent, more developed, um, the simply homes become bigger and therefore more more expensive. Uh, but then also in advanced economies, uh, we with the development of green buildings. Um, it becomes much more expensive. Yeah, there is much more. Uh, it's much more. Uh, in, um, there's much more investment into the building uh, for insulation or making it a modern office building with a lot of uh, infrastructure in there. So the buildings in themselves are becoming increasingly expensive uh, to build and to rebuild. So there, just want to add some uh, some of the um, more economic angle to to this. Um, development of exposures or um, uh, aspect. And now I'm handing back to, to Chris for the next question. Uh, thank you, Thomas, very much. Um, we have a few minutes left before we get into Q&A. So very quickly, uh, Thomas, I'll turn this over to you and then, and then Megan, you can add some thoughts as well. What is the effect on the insurance industry? Yeah, thanks. So if we um, go to the next slide, please. Uh, so what I'm showing here is uh, is losses, uh, the, the uh, type of losses uh, um, here for the U.S. and looking back um, um, from 2000 from 1990 to 2019, the distribution the right, left side, and then uh, more uh, the more recent uh, uh, development on the on the right side, and we see that uh, this increasingly 60 um, percent. Of the uh, for the last 20 years, 60% of um, of losses in the U.S. have been caused of insured losses have been caused by secondary perils, and um, so one of the, the the conclusions of this this shift is um, secondary perils are less concentrated geographically. We have primary perils, earthquake risk. We have very uh, uh, high exposed areas uh, in, in California and in the, in the New Madrid area. Uh, for hurricanes, we have uh, the southeast as a coastal exposures. Um, but uh, uh, NATCAD risks are now moving, uh, they, they are increasingly becoming um, ubiquitous uh, throughout the country. Yeah, there is uh, there's no state without uh, tornado risk. Uh, there's no state without flood risk. And so uh, so for the insurance industry is that for um, a lot of regional companies and smaller companies uh, dealing with uh, uh, NATCAD exposures um, is 
becoming uh, increasingly important. And uh, so that's the one aspect. And then the other is uh, is that the once you the dealing itself uh, has become it's becoming more difficult. Yeah? So the modeling, if uh, we see now that the the complexity of how climate change is is interacting with with some of these um, these perils um, is important to um, to um, account for this yeah? and uh, for, to account for this uh, uh, growing importance of secondary perils and um, the modeling on those um, doesn't reach back as far um, and is not as as advanced for a variety of reasons but um, it's, uh, more data intensive in certain areas and uh, so it's um, it's uh, an area to to invest in and to to catch up um, on the where the modeling needs to catch up on the the trends of the underlying perils um, we see an, accu uh, an accumulation or uh, uh, yeah the, the risk of accumulation of uh, of events yeah so as I mentioned before um, there are more frequent, smaller to medium-sized uh, um, events, so that can they can accumulate and, and uh, create, add up to the to the scale of uh, of, um, of a large uh, catastrophe. Again, this is something that um, needs to be taken into account for the modeling and for the for the product, and um, and then also uh, the scientific evidence um, around. Um, these, these relationships of, of, of driving factors of climate change and uh, assumptions about the correlation of, um, of, of risk factors, um, they need to be second-guessed yeah, because uh, the, the scientific evidence is advancing. And then uh, also, um, as, I, as I showed before with uh, one of the graphs, uh, this, this aspect of detrending is, uh, is really important. Yeah, that do, we, do we really fully understand uh, what is driving the exposures so some of this is climate change, uh, some of this is uh, socio, uh, demographic, economic. What we have shown, um, do we do we fully understand uh, what the trend is and where the current exposures are? So there's some of the um, key highlights, and then over to Megan, please. Thank you, Thomas. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So I think the key one of the key messages from this webinar has been that hurricanes and earthquakes are no longer the only events that are capable of generating billions of dollars worth of both economic and insured loss. Secondary perils like wildfire, uh, hurricane-related flood and rainfall, uh, tornado and hail, are also capable of generating losses into the billions of dollars and are becoming significant contributors to the losses that we see year over year. Uh, and I think that from our end, from the insurance industry end, our role is to, one of our roles is to be responsive. We have to continue to think about how we can address these different perils and what sort of solutions and products we can develop which would allow our clients to increase their insurance penetration and to receive more coverage for these types of events. Uh, and this is where uh, my background, my expertise comes in, obviously through the creation of parametric products, which are very much meant to fill in tr gaps in traditional coverages. And these are already well established for hurricane and earthquake. We continue to, my team and I continue to spend time and resources in looking into how can we develop them for uh, some of these secondary perils like hail, which is a product that we've recently rolled out uh, in the United States for areas which are prone to hail. And again, we continue to think about this and, and work towards generating more solutions which would allow for clients to receive more comprehensive coverage for some of these secondary perils. Wonderful. Uh, Thomas, Megan, thank you so much um, for an insightful kind of outlook and, and look into uh, the impacts of climate change. Uh, we're now going to move into Q&A. Um, and Megan, if it's okay, I'll go right back to you with, with our first question. We've been, we've been talking about hurricanes quite a bit. Um, can you provide some insights into the hurricane outlook for 2020? 
Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, so we are almost one month into hurricane season in the Atlantic. Hurricane season started June 1st. Uh, we have already had four named storms in the Atlantic. Hurric uh, Tropical storm Dolly just dissipated early this morning. Um, but while that might sound like a lot for this point in June, the devil is in the details. Uh, two of the storms, Bertha and Dolly, didn't even last 24 hours. So the number of hurricanes that form is not necessarily correlated to what sort of impact hurricane season has. We only need one event for the season to be memorable. We saw that in 1992 when Hurricane Andrew hit. Andrew, A, first storm didn't form until the end of August, but it was certainly a season to remember. Now that said, we are looking at a we are likely looking at an active hurricane season this year. The ocean temperatures in the tropical Atlantic where hurricanes form and uh, tend to intensify are warmer than average. And studies from the academic community that specifically focused on hurricanes and hurricane forecasting are suggesting that most signs will point to an active hurricane season and that we can expect there to be more storms and more hurricanes than in an average year. Thanks, Megan. Um, Thomas, I'll turn this question over to you. Uh, from time to time, I, I hear this as well. Um, is climate change actually good for the insurance industry with frequency and severity of natural catastrophes increasing, more buyers increasing rates? Isn't it actually good for the insurance industry? Um, well, it's not good for the earth. Yeah, let's 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 start with with that. And uh, and it's um, there's a lot of um, a lot of moving parts and uh, a lot of risks um, that we don't fully understand and uh, impacts for the economy and for the uh, for the healthcare system and so on. Uh, so I um, I would um, be be cautious in in making a very a very general statement about the insurance industry. <coughs> Faring different than the um, society and the economy that we sit and operate in. Uh, sure, there is uh, insurance industry is uh, I, I state or is um, there is a there's a mandate there is there's a there's a growing risk and there is the um, there, there will be growing demand for insurance solutions and uh, it is uh, it's therefore there's an opportunity there for for the insurance industry with the right products uh, with uh, um, meeting that demand to to be part of the solution and and uh, to make the yeah make make the societies more resilient. Uh, but then there is also there's a lot of uh, unknowns around. So we we talked about the the modeling uncertainty and if um, yeah the additional demand um, doesn't um, nobody does well with it if if the um, if the model the modeling was uh, was not right, and um, if you if you don't um, get the right price for that product, then it's not um, um, the industry would uh, would not do well. So it's it's only if uh, if we are able to um, to be ahead of the development or um, uh, to be able to um, to catch up with the uh, with the scientific uh, evidence fast enough. Uh, to be able to um, to meet this demand, um, and uh, there are other risks. There's, there's risks um, relating um, to uh, to the asset side. Yeah, there is the uh, there's the so-called transition risks. Certain industries um, will um, be negatively affected by by climate change and policy changes and and changes in demand. And there's this. The, um, what we call the, the stranded assets. Uh, so certain sectors will um, will not their securities will not fare well going forward. And um, the insurance industry is a big uh, investor, um, a large uh, asset accumulator, and so it's important not to to be invested uh, in those assets. So there are there are asset risks um, and um, there are modeling risks. Um, uh, so. You have to get it right, um, but uh, at the same time, it is important um, to, um, to see this as a challenge and as an opportunity uh, to provide um, the, the necessary product for this uh, increasing demand. Uh, 
uh, going forward. Thanks, Thomas. Um, Megan, maybe I'll turn this over to you to start. And Thomas, if you have anything to add, please, please do. But can you discuss uh, a connection between climate change and pandemics or epidemics? Sure. So climate change poses a public health risk because as the planet warms and air, the climate gets warmer and warmer in more and more latitudes where people actually live, we could see diseases flourish that tend to like warmer temperatures. Uh, a good example of this would be any mosquito-borne disease. As the uh, band on the earth in which mosquitoes can thrive increases latitudinally, both north and south, we could be looking at a scenario where mosquito-borne diseases that they are capable of transmitting with them join them around a greater area of the earth. And this is obviously going to expose many more people to potentially dangerous diseases. Um, so that's where climate change can kind of overlap with the public health concerns by introducing these disease vectors into previously unfavorable environments because the temperature has increased to a degree such that mosquitoes and, and any other uh, vector that can transmit disease can now thrive. Yeah. Thanks, Megan. Um, go ahead, Thomas, please. Yeah, if I um, add a different different angle to to that as well, so there is there are winners and losers, um, um, or countries dif different degrees of of of, uh, of losers, the so negative impacts of climate change on the economy. Um, if in this uh, on the macro side, uh, in, in the various um, model scenarios, and um, a lot of um, Poorer countries, uh, agricultural countries, they're more um, more located in in, in heat exposed areas. Uh, they are likely to suffer more um, from uh, rising temperatures and from extreme uh, uh, temperature events, uh, or from from other natural catastrophes that we had been discussing just before. And so. So these are these are countries that are not as resilient anyway uh, of, of dealing with, um, with these types of catastrophes. Uh, but then they so they they are also uh, then weakened in their in their healthcare system. So there might be um, so in that sense um, they they basically have double exposures. Yeah, they they are exposed to to more of these uh, weather related uh, risks. Uh, that weakens their their public finances, it weakens their healthcare system, um, it weakens the household's finances, and thus become more vulnerable um, to um, uh, pandemics. So if there if there's a pandemic, um, you know, they they're not um, as, uh, they're more severely affected by such an outcome. So it's it's, uh, it's it ties into one of our these uh, meta topics of of resilience. And, uh, and climate change um, is uh, likely to weaken the resilience of um, uh, certain regions of the of the Earth, and um, pandemics are also tied into the same uh, or similar um, aspects of uh, weaker resilience. So there's there's also this, this indirect economic um, nexus between uh, these um, yeah these perils. Thanks, Thomas. Um, Megan, one final question, and I'll turn over to you. What is the connection between climate change and hail, convective storm, and tornadoes? The current thinking is that there's very little, although there's really not enough data to determine it. Uh, tornadoes, hail, are really regional phenomenon. They affect a very small area when they do occur. So there's simply just not enough data right, out there right now to draw any sort of definitive conclusion as to what impact, if any, climate change is having on the frequency, severity, or locations of where severe convective thunderstorms form and where they are capable of spawning tornadoes or dropping significant significantly sized hail. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Thomas, Megan, um, that was fantastic. That's all the time we have today uh, for Q&A and appreciate um, you walking us through some of these issues. Um, the recording of this webinar will be available in the coming days if you want to listen again or share with any of your contacts or colleagues. Um, we'll be back after the 4th of July with more virtual content. Next up on July 15th, we'll host a webinar on insurance solutions for the hardening market. And then on July 22nd, we'll host a webinar on our new parametric hail product that Megan referenced called Hail. In the fall, in the fall we'll hold more events to cover new emerging risks, fragility in the supply chain, and an advanced dive into NDBI and parametric case studies. All of these uh, resulting really from audience input uh, and feedback. So please stay tuned for the invites and um, follow Swiss Re Corporate Solutions on LinkedIn for kind of real-time updates on that front. In the meantime, please reach out to me or any of today's presenters with questions. We'd be happy to continue the conversation with you. Um, once again, thank you to Megan and Thomas for a really thoughtful dialogue on a very important topic. And thank you to the audience for joining us today. We hope to speak with you soon. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.